in this message we look at a few new testament passage that speak to us believers on how we should live our daily christian lives in view of the end times and life hereafter All right let's stand up to make our declaration right now so if you don't mind let's stand to our feet and we'll hold our bible high up in the air and uh, we'll uh, make our declaration out loud bold and strong together so if you brought your bible just hold it high up in the air Let's say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God. a servant of Christ and a channel of his blessing to many people i receive his word i believe his word and i live by his word christ is my master and to him i am in absolute surrender in jesus name amen god bless you turn around please to the person next to you say hi get to know them and uh, you may be seated please All right. We'll get into God's word this morning. Uh we've been doing a series on the end times uh, and I think last three Sundays have been very intense. Is <laughs> it uh sometimes I get worried with it, you know, the the content is too much. Uh but just to quickly review first Sunday, uh we talked about uh the Bible being a prophetic book. How there are prophecies in the word of God, some which are decades in advance, some which are hundreds of years in advance some uh there are even thousands of years in advance and uh, these prophecies have been fulfilled exactly as they have been foretold so the bible is a prophetic book a book that you and i can completely rely on and and that's how we can go to the bible and look at the prophecies concerning the end times and understand that uh the second sermon in the series we talked about Israel the land and its people the importance of Israel uh the people uh the city of Jerusalem the temple mount all of these things how very important they are to end time bible prophecy and how a lot of what god has foretold concerning the end time centers around the land its people the city and the temple mount last sunday uh we did a panoramic overview of uh the sequence of events that will take place in the end time starting from the rapture of the church all the way uh to the new heavens and the new earth and uh we we try to give a highlight that uh the sequence of of those events that are going to take place as given to us in scripture uh for those of you who would like to study that more the sermon notes are available we cover uh, a lot more in detail this morning is going to be light it's not going to be so intense uh what we're going to do is just pick up a few passages uh from the new testament um that uh speak to us concerning the end times so uh in the sermon notes that's available on the website you'll have all the scriptures almost all the scriptures concerning the end times in the new new testament listed so there are you know several hundred verses of of scriptures um, that speak about the end times but this morning we're going to just pick a few passages uh concerning the end times and 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 look at them uh the purpose of what we're going to do this morning is simply this What does the New Testament tell us as believers? What how should we live life? What should we do in view of the fact that we are in the end times? How do we live life? How are we supposed to live in view of the fact that we are in the end times? So that's what our objective is, right? So it's slightly different from the last three sermons which was more uh descriptive of events and things that were uh, that have taken place or going to take place. Today we are talking about our lives as new testament believers in view of the fact that we are in the end times we possibly could be that last generation that sees all these things unfold or we could be very close to it so in view of that what should we live live like what should our life be we're going to pick up a few passages the first passage we're going to go is matthew the 25th chapter we're going to survey the entire chapter matthew chapter 25 i'm not going to read that entire chapter for us but we will quickly summarize it and bring out key points. So in Matthew the 25th chapter, the Lord Jesus is giving three stories or three parables or three illustrations uh through which he is communicating to you and me 
how we should live, how he wants us to live in view of things that are to come, in view of eternal things. How should we live here and now uh, in view of what is coming up in Matthew 25? We, three, we see three stories, three parables, three illustrations. The first one, and we are all very familiar with it, so I'm just going to uh, state or just describe that story and then we'll get into the meaning of it, the application of it. In Matthew 25, the first one he talks about uh, is a parable or the story of the wise and foolish virgins, or otherwise people call it uh, the parable of the ten virgins. So Jesus draws from the Jewish tradition of the wedding. Uh, how we know when a, a, a bride and a groom are about to be married, they, uh, uh, they have, the, the, the families come together, they get engaged, and then the groom goes away. He goes to prepare a place, get himself ready, and a place ready for his future wife and the life that they're going to have together. And the bride goes away and she prepares herself for the upcoming wedding. Now, neither the bride or the groom know when the wedding is going to take place. So forget printing your wedding cards and all that. You know? They don't know. Neither of them know when the wedding is going to take place. It's up to the father of the groom to decide. So if the groom has to prepare the place. He's got to get things ready. The bride is preparing herself. And usually the duration may extend over nine months as a test also for the bride to demonstrate her virginity that she's truly a virgin. She's ready. uh, She's fit to be married. So there is this waiting time, which is not only a preparation time, but also a testing time. And finally, when the groom, when the the father of the groom is ready, then he says, okay, it's time. So only the father knows when the wedding is. And he announces, okay, it's time. Then they come together and then there is this wedding celebration that typically would go on for seven days uh, of day and night celebration uh, uh, of the wedding. So against that backdrop, Jesus gives this illustration. He says, you know, there are these ten virgins who are waiting to become part of that, uh, become part of the bridal party or that wedding party. They're waiting. They're waiting for the, their entrance into the party. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've come prepared to some extent with lambs waiting because they know they have some idea, some indication that it's this night, that tonight's the night, but they don't, still don't know when. So they're waiting. Tonight could be the night. We're ready. We're here at the door. When the door opens, we're going to get in, join the, bridal, uh, the, the wedding celebration. But now, you know, it doesn't come as soon as they expect. They slumber, they sleep. Uh, five of them run out of oil. And then suddenly there is this announcement, and so they go off to get some oil. And then suddenly there is this announcement, the bride, uh, that the groom is coming. This is in Matthew, the 25th chapter, and verse 6. And at midnight, a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. So now the announcement is made, the bridegroom is coming, the doors are opening, it's time to go in, become part of the party. Or the wedding celebration. So here were these virgins, five of them who had oil, were ready. And they were, when the doors opened, they stepped in. Five of them had gone off to get oil. They missed it. They could not become part of the wedding celebration. What is the message Jesus wants to convey to us? That's in verse 13. So he says, I'm giving you the story for this reason. What do I want to convey to you? Watch therefore... For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is. So why am I telling you this story? Jesus says, for one reason. I want you to always be in a state of readiness. Just be ready. Now, think about this. Jesus did not say, here's a story I'd like to leave behind for that one generation that's going to show up at the very end. For them, this is a story. He didn't say that. This story is for all believers of all generations, whether you're in 180 or whether you're in 2016, this story is for you. Amen? That means he's not excluding anybody. He says, listen, regardless of which generation you're living in, this is how you live. For all believers across all time, across all generations, this is how I want you to be living on the earth. Always in a state of readiness anticipating the coming of the Lord, even though you do not know the hour in which he comes. So it's incumbent on all of us as believers. We've always got to live in a state of readiness. I'm ready, Lord. Are you with me? That's how. 
in view of the fact that the Lord is coming, I always have to live ready. Lord, if you come today, I'm ready. You come tomorrow, tomorrow comes, I'll live ready. I'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. Now, I know that sometimes some preachers add a lot more to this story. You know, they say, okay, the lamp is the Holy Spirit. So unless you have, you know, unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues, you won't make it to heaven. I, 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 that's not what Jesus intended in this story, right? So it's wrong to allegorize. Allegorize means to add to the story more than what the speaker intended. It's wrong to do that. So uh, I don't subscribe to those kinds of interpretations of this passage. I'm making mention of it here because sometimes people want to say, okay, what does the oil mean? What does the lamp mean? Uh, what does the skirt mean? What does the hairdo mean? <laughs> so forget all that. What's the message that Jesus wants us to get? He said, always be ready. That's the message. Don't add to it more than what he intended to convey to us. The second story in this chapter in Matthew 25 he talks about the parable of the talents. And once again, he's kind of illustrating himself. He says, you know, there's a, there's a landlord uh, who has his servants here. He calls them. Uh, he gives to each one a certain amount of money. And then he goes away into a far country to receive an inheritance, to receive something. And he says, you know, he gives them money, tells them to be engaged, and he goes away. And then at the appointed time, he comes back. And now he asks account from each one of them, saying, tell me, what did you do with what I gave you? And so the man who received uh, five talents, he says, Lord, I multiplied it. I've got ten. And I have one who says, you know, I've received uh, uh, two talents. I multiplied it. The person who received one, he says, you know, Lord, I just kept it. I didn't do anything with it. Take it back. And the Lord commends the first two, those who multiplied what he gave by engaging, by doing something. And he condemns the one who didn't do anything with what was given. Now, the parallel story in Luke 19 Uh, Sorry, in Matthew 25, Jesus says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little things. I will now make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's Matthew 25. In Luke 19, the parallel passage, the master says, You've been faithful in in little things. I will make you ruler over so many cities. So what's this story telling us? The story is telling us that our future reward in the joy of the Lord, in the glory of of the Lord, when he comes and he reigns, our future reward or our role and responsibility in his future kingdom is dependent, it is connected to what we do here on earth right now in our lives. Are you with me? The role and responsibility you and I will receive in the future kingdom is connected to our stewardship here and now. If you're faithful over what God's given you now, whether it's little or whatever it is, that will be rewarded in the future kingdom. Amen? Now, the other interesting thing is this. In anticipation of the coming of the Lord, the thing he wants to impress on our hearts is, I don't want you to sit down, abandon life and do nothing. But rather, knowing that I am coming back, I want you to be as busy as you can. Be a good steward. Take everything I've given you, maximize it. For the sake of the kingdom. That's the way we're supposed to live. Are you with me? So in view of all that we know about eternity. In view of all that we know that is going to come in in the future. What is my response? It is not as many have mistakenly done. That has isolated themselves from the world. And gone off into some sort of a life that is totally disconnected and, and not useful. That's not the correct response. Jesus says, occupy till I come. Be busy till I come. Engage the world till I come. That means use everything I've given you. Engage the world. Serve the cause of the kingdom. Be busy until I return. That's talking about stewardship. Are you with me? Whatever you have. You may have a little. You may have a little more than somebody else. But use it to the maximum that you can. Be a good steward of it. And use it for the sake of his kingdom. Because he's going to come back and ask an accounts. What did you do with, that, with, that, with what I gave you? So the second story illustrates to us that we must be good stewards. Take what God has given you. The resources, the time, the energy, the skills, the talents, the ideas, the creativity. Whatever God has put in your hands, take it and use it max to the max for his kingdom. To glorify him for his purposes. Amen. The third story in this uh, passage in Matthew 25 is the story of the sheep and the goats. When he talks about, this is in verse 31, when he comes in his glory, he will sit on his glory and all nations, everyone will be gathered before him. He's talking about that final judgment. 
And he's going to have the sheep and the goat separated. And to the sheep, he's going to say, you know, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. And they're going to reply and say, Lord, when did we see you all in all of these states? And, and, and when did we do these things for you? And he's going to tell them, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. And he's going to look at the other side. And he says, you know, I was in this, in this state, but he never did it. So depart. So this story is telling us the importance of serving people in Jesus' name. Now, I'm sure he didn't, imp- uh, uh, didn't intend to indicate that you only serve people who are hungry, thirsty, naked, in prison. The point is, when you do it to anyone in the name of the Lord, in as much as you do it for the least of these, my, whatever you do, he says, it will not go unnoticed. So the third thing he's impressing on our hearts is in view of all that is to come, you serve people, even the least. Even when you're not, when you're not recognized, when you're not noticed, you serve people. Do it because of me. Do it as unto me. Jesus said in John 13, verse 20, he said, if anybody receives you, they receive me. So when you receive somebody in the name of the Lord, you are receiving Jesus. Just do that. And even the smallest thing you do to serve God's people will not go unnoticed. There's a reward. He will reward you. Are you with me so far? Okay. So three simple things from this chapter in Matthew 25. First, always live in a state of readiness. Second, stewardship. Use whatever God's put in your hands. Third, serve. Even the least, the smallest, insignificant. Serve in the name of the Lord. You will be rewarded. I want to go to another passage here in John 14. I'll just look at a few passages this morning. John 14 is a passage that's familiar to many of us. John 14 verses 1 to 6. Jesus said in John 14 verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is saying this. He says, you know, I want you to know something. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I'll take you there. So in view of this, it says, let not your heart be, let not your heart be, don't be discouraged. So what's my response as a believer? You know, in life, we all go through things. We go through stuff. All kinds of things can happen. Painful things can happen. Unexpected things. None of us can predict you know, some of the challenges that we're going to face down the road. None of us can predict that. And we, we, there are going to be those challenges. I guess when we are in our teens, we have a very idealistic view of what life is going to be. And then as you actually journey through life, you realize all the different challenges you actually face. And life is not ideal on this earth. There'll be the ups and downs of the mountains, the valleys, the dark nights, all of that. And everybody goes, nobody's exempt. But in the midst of all of that, Jesus is saying, You go through it, you don't have to come under it. You don't have to come under it. Let not your heart be and don't get discouraged. Why? Because of this. I'm preparing a place for you. And I'm going to come again. I'm going to take you there. And in that place, there's no more weeping, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. None of the stuff that we have to go through here on earth. So he says, if, you, if your, heart is, your heart understands that, your heart is gripped by that, he says, let not your heart be. I'm not saying we live, in a, live a life of denial, that we don't recognize the pain, the sorrow, the grief, the struggle, the challenges. No, those things are real. We go through it. Yes, we cry. Yes, we feel the hurt. Yes, that's there. But while all that is happening, there is this hope that brings us comfort, that brings us consolation, that one day I'm going to be in a place with the Lord where there is none of this. Therefore, I will not let my heart be troubled. I will not be discouraged. I'm not going to come under this. Amen. So in view 
of the future. We are people with greatest hope. Amen? That we are going to be with him. In spite of all the pain, in spite of all the struggles, in spite of all the things we go through here on earth, there's a father's house. I'm going there. It's going to be good. Amen? Therefore, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be discouraged. Jesus says, I am the way. I mean, if you've got me, you've got it. You've got it. You're on the way. I am the way, the truth, the life. That's all you need to get there. Me, Jesus, I am the way. Amen? So as God's people, as people who look ahead into the future, this is it. That in the midst of our most difficult times, this is our hope. This is our consolation. I'm going to my father's house. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15. This is a very, very challenging passage. Challenging in the sense that it, it challenges us to take a close look at what we're doing in our lives and what's going on. We look at this in probably one more passage and then we close. In First Corinthians chapter 3, we'll read verses 10 to 15. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than what is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So Paul is describing the judgment of believers in heaven. So we're going to stand, we're going to be in heaven and our works, our life on earth is going to be judged. Now, this passage applies both to the local church and to each one of us as believers. Yes, Paul is addressing the church in Corinth and he's addressing issues and in that process he's presenting this. But also in this passage, he talks about each one, meaning he talks about every believer. So the application of this passage holds good for every person, each one of us here this morning. What is Paul saying? We all have a common foundation for our salvation. It's Jesus Christ. But how you build on it and with what you build on it is very important. How are you going to build? Let every man take heed how he builds on this. How are we supposed to build? We are supposed to build according to God's plan, God's will, or God's blueprints. Now you want to build a building, what do you do? You build according to the architect, the blueprint given to you by the architect. So, so also in our lives, we all have a common foundation, Jesus Christ. Now how we build on that foundation should be according to the will of God. To his plan, his purpose for your individual life, for my individual life. How I build. And he also says, with what you build. If you build with wood, hay, straw, all of it will be burnt. You can have the finest looking building, but if it's built with wood, hay, straw, it will not stand the test of fire. Instead, if you build with gold, silver, and precious stones, you'll get your rewards. What is the distinction he's trying to make? Wood, hay, and straw represent the works of the flesh. The Bible is very clear. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. What's of the flesh will not step into the kingdom. Works of the flesh. What are works of the flesh? Galatians chapter 5, describe it. He says the works of the flesh are manifest. Jealousy, hatred, anger, strife. These are the kinds of things that are the works of the flesh. So even if I do a good thing, but if I do it motivated by the flesh... It will not stand the test in heaven. Are you with me? Yes? Even if you do the right thing, you can do the good thing. But if you do it motivated by the wrong thing, reasons, jealousy, anger, pride, self, selfishness, and self-centeredness, all these things are works of the flesh, he said it will not stand the test of heaven. Jesus made a very strong statement in Matthew, the seventh chapter. He said, you know, in that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, have we not in your name prophesied in your name? We've cast out devils in your name. We've done many miracles in your name. And Jesus will rebuke them. And he says, you'll tell them, depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Meaning these people, you've done all these wonderful things. They are the right things, but he calls them lawlessness. He calls them sin. He calls them workers of lawlessness. 
How could it be? They've been doing it in his name. It all looks good, prophesying, healing, casting, all that's good. But yet he calls them lawlessness. Why? For two reasons in that passage. First, he says, you must do the will of my father. Second, he says, I never knew you. It wasn't birthed of me. Are you understanding? So what is the call here? In view of the fact that one day you and I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, how I build upon my salvation, what I do with my life has to be governed by two things. One, I must build according to God's will, plan, and purpose for my life. God, am I doing what you want me to do? Second, it has to be built by gold, silver, and precious stones. These represent what's divine, what's of the spirit. That means it's God working through me, and I'm only presenting myself as a pure heart, saying, God, my heart is void of jealousy and strife and competition. I'm not doing it for any of these reasons. I'm doing it purely because I want Jesus Christ to be glorified. Then, it's gold, silver, and precious stones. Are you with me? So, what do I want to challenge us with as believers? You know, we're, all, we're going to be saved. Even if everything we do is, is wood, hay, and stubble, it's burned, the Bible says you'll still be saved. You're safe. As far as salvation is concerned. But the works will be destroyed. There will be no reward. Why? Because it was works of the flesh. Things that were motivated out of self. Out of pride. Out of jealousy. Competition. Strife. Envy. Those are the works of the flesh. Even the right things were motivated by the wrong reasons. They are still the works of the flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. So as believers I want to invite you and I. Saying God I want to live this life according to your plan, according to your purpose. What you want me to do, I want to do it according to your plan, your purpose. And secondly, God, I want it to be birthed by your spirit. I just want to present a pure heart where everything I do must glorify Jesus. I'm not seeking things for my own. Are you with me? But I also want to put another challenge to you and me. It also means that we have to examine everything we see in the Christian world. Because not everything that has a label, Jesus, is necessarily a work of the spirit. It could be a nice looking thing made of wood, hay and straw, but it has the right label around it. And you don't want to be part of that. Are you with me? In today's Christian world, there are so many things happening. It's so easy to be caught up in the hype and the fad and in all the nice outward appearance of things that many of us fail to look beyond the label to see what's this really made of. Is it wood, hay and straw or is it gold, silver and precious stones? Because if it's wood, hay and straw, you don't want to be a part of it. But if it's gold, silver, and precious stones, you want to be part of that. So look past the label. Amen? The last passage I want to look at is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, we'll close with this. Jonathan, if you don't mind, could you please come up and be on the keyboard? Just play for us, please. And 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll read verses 1 to 8. I'll make a few comments and we'll take some time to pray. The Apostle Paul writes here, he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ... Who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at and his kingdom. Saying, Timothy, this is the commission I'm giving you. This is a charge I'm giving you in view of the fact that Jesus Christ is going to return. And he's going to judge people. What, should I, what do I want you to do? Verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, in your afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So Paul begins in verse 1. He says, Timothy, in view of the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back to judge every person, And he's also giving his final words. This is the very last epistle the Apostle Paul wrote. This is the concluding passage of his final epistle. And so he's saying, you know, Timothy, I know I've done my part. I've run the race. I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. And I know that there is a reward for me. So in between these two things, he says, Timothy, here's my final instruction. 
preach the words preach the words and he says do this with all you've got you convince people you rebuke people you exhort people because Timothy a time is coming when people will no longer want to hear the truth they no longer will want to hear sound doctrine but they will promote teachers who will speak to them nice stories fables fables are nice stories now you can use stories to point people to the truth or you can use stories just to make people good feel good it says timothy the time is coming when the church is writing to the church they'll raise up they'll promote teachers who who just speak fables who speak stories people will no longer want to hear sound doctrine they will no longer want to hear the truth so timothy here's what i want you to do you preach the words you fulfill your ministry that's it preach the word when the disciples of jesus came to the lord in matthew 24 and said lord tell us what are the signs of your coming the first sign the first sign jesus said that there will be great deception on the earth first sign matthew 24 first sign many will be deceived meaning people will be led away from the truth from the word of god going astray wanting to hear nice things but not willing to hear sound doctrine so what am i what am i presenting to you and me we've got to be people who are established in the word of god if any time there was this need it's now for us to be established in the word god's holy word because there are lots of storytellers there are lots of things around us that we can hear which can become a substitute of the word it can appeal to our ears but it cannot transform our hearts or lives and so he says timothy just preach the word get people established in the word of god we as a people must be established in the truth because deception around us is only going to increase and it's sad to see that even in the church deception creeps in so we need to be established in the word of god amen let's stand to our feet please this morning we've just looked at a few new testament passages in view of all that's coming up ahead Matthew 25 Jesus told us always live ready Be a good steward be busy with what you've got and serve the littlest ones in the name of the Lord The smallest thing you do in the name of the Lord will not go unnoticed It's you doing it unto him So serve people in the name of the Lord In John 14 He says don't be troubled. I'm building a place for you. I'm going to come and take you there. All of this sorrow, all this pain, all this hurt, all of this thing will be gone. So don't let your heart be troubled. Don't get discouraged. In 1 Corinthians 3 It's important that we build our lives according to the will of God. Find out from God, what do you want me to do, Lord? Am I living according to your will? And then whatever you do, do it with a pure heart. Don't do it for competition. Don't do it for strife. Don't do it of envy. Just do it with a pure heart. Do it to glorify Jesus. That's it. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4. even as deception all around us and fables and stories and all kinds of things increase let's be established in the word of god stay in the word be established in the truth thank you 
Jesus. I just want to pray right now for anybody here that you may have felt your faith weakening in some way. Maybe you've seemed like you're drifting away from the Lord, just drifting away from your faith, from that strength that you once had. I'm going to pray with you this morning. But even as you're standing here in the presence of God, that God will restore you, that God will strengthen you. The Bible tells us he's able to save us to the uttermost. Meaning, it doesn't matter how many times you've fallen, no matter how many times you've drifted away, he's able to save us to the uttermost. And this morning, I just believe there's restoration that God will bring into your life. So if there's any person here, you feel like, man, I've just been weakening. I've been drifting away. And this morning, I've just awaken to that I need to get back on my feet right where you are would you pray and say Jesus could you restore me bring me back Lord I want to walk with you once again I don't want to drift away bring me back Jesus just pray in your own heart right where you are Father, we pray in Jesus' name that by your Holy Spirit that you will just bring a restoration, God. And any person here who may have been drifting away from the faith for whatever reason, who may have been slowly weakening in their faith, Lord, restore them this morning. Let the strength of the Holy Spirit be released into their hearts, into their minds this morning. Restore, Lord. Restore. Just thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just pray that each one of us will live our lives according to the will of God and that we will build with pure hearts not the works of the flesh but really the work of the spirit through us and we just remain as yielded vessels that's all build it through us we pray build it through us what is of gold, silver, and precious stones built for us. We pray the touch of your Holy Spirit on every work we do, God, whatever it might be, whether we are in schools, in our colleges, whatever area of work we do, let the touch of the Holy Spirit be upon it. That it'll be meaningful, it'll be purposeful, it'll be for Jesus. It'll be for the kingdom. It'll be for the kingdom. Thank you, Lord. pray for this one one thing here I don't know if there's any person it's almost likely a young person but could be anybody but you know, you've you've ha- you've been thinking God I, I want to be engaged in the life sciences and I see specifically something like biology or something in that area but but the big question in your mind is God is this going to glorify you is, is this is this right for me anybody here you you're like that you identify what I'm saying just put your hand up 
I see one. Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I just feel to tell you, and I know you're way at the back, but I just feel this morning the Lord just wants to affirm that that's your place. That's the area that you need to go into. So just go ahead and just say, God, that's mine. That's for me. I'm moving ahead in this. I believe that God will use you even in that area. So don't hold back. Don't hesitate. I just feel that you take that, you pray about it, just move ahead into what God wants you to do in that area. Anybody else with that? Okay. Just one person. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I praise you. Thank you. So, Father, we just surrender, Lord. Everything we do, everything in our worlds, let it be for you, let it be for your glory, let it be for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our Father, and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each one of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Next Sunday, we're going to look at the Old Testament. We're going to talk mainly from the book of Daniel. So if you always read the book of Daniel and wondered what are all those difficult things in Daniel, be here next Sunday. We'll explain that. And the following Sunday, which will be the last Sunday in this series, we'll give a good overview of Revelation so that when you read the book of Revelation, it'll all make sense what, it, what it's all about. So don't miss next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great week. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.